Yo, what's up? We're back, and this week it's for UFC 247, and uh, we had another successful gambling week um, two weeks ago. We didn't have an event last week, but uh, we hit on the parlay of the week uh, a couple weeks ago. We hit on the most confident pick as well, and uh, we're going to be looking to uh, do that again. We've been uh, you know, on a roll lately with the uh, parlays, so uh, hopefully we, that can continue. And uh, in the UFC 247, where it's two title fights, it's a big card, and uh, looking to do a little bit uh, better... Uh, on the picks overall, but yeah, so make sure to, uh, you know, hit the like button, I want to try to get to 200 likes this time, uh, it is my birthday on February 5th, so, uh, you know, show me some love, let's see if, uh, on this week we could do good on the bets, uh, uh, we could do good, uh, on the likes, we can do good on the views, on the comments, everything, so yeah, uh, thanks a lot for, uh, all the support, make sure to, uh, comment, like, subscribe, tell me, uh, what you agree with, don't agree with, uh, what your parlays are, uh, what bets you're doing, all that. So we're going to get right into the first fight of the night, which is a late, uh, I think it's a late replacement fight. I'm not really sure. I mean, uh, either way, they got it on short notice, but I believe maybe it's not late replacement. I think they were matched up against each other to begin with, but uh, it was made like real short notice. But it's uh, Austin Lingo. He's taken on uh, Yusuf Zalal. And Austin Lingo, he is uh, undefeated, so he is the guy with the better record here. And he's fighting out of a hyped hyped gym right now, um, deservedly so, in Fortis MMA, which has been doing real well. And that is a gym based out of, out of Texas, so I'm sure he's going to have the crowd support there. And uh, Lingo, he's an aggressive guy. He has four wins in under a minute. And uh, he's a boxer. He has one punch power, both hands. And he likes to take the center, back you towards the cage, uh, Good jab, good straight punches, really concussive hooks. He uh, double jabs his way into uh, hook combinations and definitely has fight ending power in the left hook. Um, I've seen him sleep people with it in 13 seconds with one shot. And uh, very fast hand speed and a good chin as well. Definitely willing to trade with uh, with opponents. Uh, he forces brawls and then uh, usually ends up the winner of those. He really has faith in his chin. And uh, he will throw some occasional low kicks, but pretty one-dimensional guy. He really just wants to box with you, get inside. And uh, fighters who have success against him are wrestlers, in my opinion, or who will have success against him. Obviously, he's undefeated. Will be wrestlers or people who can, uh, you know, stick and move, pot shot him from the outside, frustrate him, walk him into shots. Lingo is hittable, but he's willing to eat shots, keep coming forward. Uh, he has the durability, he has the cardio, he has the heart, and... Uh, He's seven and zero. He has three knockouts, and uh, in the amateurs, he was knocked out by Charles Williams. So he has been finished one time in his career, at least uh, not in his pro career. But um, he did avenge that loss as a professional, and um, he doesn't really have a lot of grappling footage out there. But I don't think he's a great grappler from what I've seen. His wrestling looks subpar, and he's been taken down very easily with uh, double legs, clinch takedowns. He looks a little lost in the clinch. He doesn't dig underhooks very well. Doesn't look to wrestle offensively much, and he's a guillotine hunter. He will look uh, to counter takedowns uh, with the guillotine, or he'll try to get it from inside of uh, his guard, but that's a bad tendency to me against higher-level competition. He pulls uh, guard for that guillotine, and uh, I don't see him getting that against many opponents. His, you know, his game off of his back uh, isn't very high-level. He does have two submissions in his career, and he definitely has good cardio. He's going to fight for your money, so... Uh, you know, he's a guy that's uh, going to be a fun guy to watch. He's definitely entertaining, I'll say that. And for Yusuf Zalal, he's a 7-2 and two prospect. He's coming out of Factory X. So both these guys are training out of fairly good gyms. And Yusuf, you know, he's been working a lot with um, uh, Jonathan Martinez, who's also on this card, and they're in uh, the same weight class. So that should, uh, you know, be helpful to him. Or I believe, actually, uh, Martinez is 135. I'm sorry, this is at 45s, but... Similar size, and, uh, you know, Yusuf, he had a highlight in his last fight. He won with a big flying knee, which probably helped give him this opportunity, if we're being honest, because he has lost two of his last three fights, but he has finished all seven of his wins, and he's undoubtedly fought the tougher competition, but obviously he's also tasted defeat. And Zalor, is a tall, lanky striker, nice movement, and that movement's going to need to be on full display this match, and he doesn't want to get his back against the cage he doesn't want to be stagnant but he's good at that he's always switching stances good head movement he does hold his hands low and that's a little nerve-wracking against a guy like lingo so definitely has to be uh very sharp he isn't great with the hands he will throw the jab out there he will use a one-two but his defense and boxing range uh 
isn't very good. He leans back a lot and looks a little bit hittable if he's going to be facing a higher level guy. And he does have some nice low kicks. He has uh, very nice round and front kicks. He'll go body head with those uh, nice question mark kicks. And he looks to, uh, you know, be kicking and moving really on the feet until he can time level changes. Really nice flying knee in his last match though. So he is uh, diversifying a little bit. He is fast. He is explosive. And I will say he's probably the better athlete of the two fighters here. And uh, he also has two KOTKOs. I've seen him get rocked with punches, but I've never seen him get dropped. And he does look to recover uh, pretty well pretty quickly. And I would say striking is definitely improving. But uh, I would have to give Lingo the edge on the feet here. For uh, the ground game with Zalal, you know, he likes to mix it up. I see him as the clearly superior grappler in this fight. He has uh, nice level changes, good single, good doubles, and uh, good clinch takedowns as well. So he really can mix it up. I definitely see him getting a few takedowns in this match. And in top position, uh, he has good control, good ground and pound. He'll throw big elbows, and he really cuts guys open. But his main objective is getting to that back mount. He'll uh, lock in rear naked chokes there. He'll also uh, attack front chokes like guillotines, darces, bravo chokes when... Uh, Opponents will belly down to stand up. He does have five submissions. He's never been finished. And uh, he's finished all of his wins. So he's a guy that goes out there, goes for the finish. And, um, you know, I think Zalal needs to wrestle in this match. I really don't think Lingo's grappling is very good. I see Zalal being able to get takedowns almost at will here. And off of Lingo's, or Lingo off of his back, uh, I see him attacking with some low-level subs, but I think Zalal is just too good for that. On the feet, I will be nervous Lingo can get the KO, but Zalal has good movement. He's a smart guy. He'll move, make Lingo miss, and then go for the takedown, in my opinion. And he obviously has to be very careful, but um, Lingo, he's going to be looking to cut him off, uh, shut his lights off, you know. And anytime it's on the feet, I feel Zalal is going to be a little bit vulnerable. But uh, I'm going to pick Zalal via first-round submission. I believe he's the superior grappler. I think he's going to expose that part of uh, Austin Lingo's game and uh, give him his first loss. So give me the underdog odds with uh, Yusuf Zalal here. And uh, up next, we sh should have a pretty fun matchup between Andre Yule and the uh, aforementioned Jonathan Martinez. And uh, Andre Yule, he's making his first start of 2020, and he's looking to rebound from that loss he had to Cheeto Vera. And uh, Ewell, you know, he hasn't really found consistency so far in his UFC career. He's been trading wins and losses. But uh, he's uh, very fast, very long. He's explosive, powerful. Uh, good jab, good left hook, really good straight right hand, and a uh, good one, too. And his whole game is really predicated on countering with that, uh, you know, one, two. He'll counter with the uh, lead hand jab, the left hook. Um, you know, he tries to touch his opponent to make him commit, pull counter with the right hand. And, uh, you know, he'll plant and spring into uh, straights, overhand hooks. Definitely he's willing to trade. He has fast hand speed. And, um... And against Cheeto Vera, he was landing a lot of wide hook combinations. He was landing a lot of nasty body shots. Uh, he'll throw some leg kicks, some snap kicks up the middle, some round kicks to the head. And, um, you know, he is primarily what uses his hands, though, I would say. You know, he really is a guy that uses his hands. I would say he kind of has a questionable chin, and he can leave his chin high sometimes. Um, you know, Nathaniel Wood was able to drop him. Uh, and uh, Ewell was hurt by low kicks when he fought Cheeto Vera. Vera hit him with some big knees, dropped him, and he was the first fighter to beat Ewell by TKO. Ewell does have seven KO TKOs to, him, uh, to his name himself. Definitely has power, and, uh, you know, on the ground, he's not really a great grappler. Um, he's gotten a lot better at defending takedowns, though, and, um, you know, he can get up against the cage now. Um, you know, uh, He's also decent, you know, exploding back to his feet when he gets taken down. And he, he can control on the ground and, uh, you know, kind of not allow himself to get submitted. But he doesn't have good uh, get-ups against really good grapplers. You know, Nathaniel Wood was able to keep him on his back, control him, and eventually submitted him when Ewell eventually tried to stand up. And, uh, you know, in his match with Marlon Vera, he did show some improved takedown defense, uh, and uh, good uh, submission defense. He did better in that realm. And he even had some top control time in that fight. I feel probably it's going to be a stand-up fight. But I could see Martinez maybe trying to get takedowns here. Mix it up. And uh, Yule has been submitted three times. But two of those have came against uh, very high-level op high opponents. And uh, 
He has four submissions himself. So, I mean, a lot of his losses, when you look at it, like his last three losses, uh, Patchy Mix, Marlon Vera, and Nathaniel Wood, all three of those guys are arguably top 15 guys in the world at 135 pounds. And Martinez, you know, he's never seen that level of competition. So, uh, you know, say what you want, but Yule's losing to very good guys. And uh, Jonathan Martinez, you know, he's getting a step up here. He's had back-to-back victories. He did have that big knockout of Ping Wan Lu. And, uh, you know, so he's getting a good fight here against Andre Yule to try to uh, break into the, you know, getting top 15 matchups. And he's a tough, scrappy kid. He has a lot of heart also. And he's steadily been improving his confidence, his technique. Uh, he's a rangy southpaw, good kicks. And he's small for the division, but a very quick, good movement. He uh, walks opponents down, he faints, he throws occasional kicks, looking to draw out shots. And uh, really nice rear leg front kicks to the body, to the head. Good round kicks. And in his la- last match, he threw a really nasty uh, front knee to the chin that uh, took out Ping Wan Lu. And he has three knockouts with knees, so his knees are very dangerous. Uh, his boxing isn't very good. He isn't super active with the hands. He will throw the jab, the right hook, but really relies on knees, kicks, pull counters. He'll throw a pull counter jab, pull counter straight lefts, and he isn't bad at planning on his back foot and, uh, you know, catching opponents when they come in blitzing. But uh, he can struggle with pressure with combinations, and uh, he has a tendency to shell up, not move his feet. So uh, when he fought Andre Sukupath, he kind of got dominated. He was backing towards the fence. He didn't really, um, you know, give himself enough space to... Uh, throw back or do much was shelling up and uh you know Sukumtaf was just throwing body head piecing him up and Martinez does have a a good chin and he's smart in how he protects himself uh he'll flop down to his back when he's hurt and he is hittable you know especially against more athletic guys but um you know he works to recover well he was dropped twice first Andre he did survive and he's never been finishing his career so uh props to him for that he does have six career KO TKOs and uh He's also a pretty solid grappler. Um, you know, he's decent in the clinch. In his match with Andre Sukumtath, he did get a body lock takedown, took the back, and he showed some strong uh, scrambling ability against Wuliji Burin. Uh, he wasn't able to stop the takedowns, but he did hit multiple sweeps. And uh, he isn't a big ground and pound guy on top, but he did open up with some big shots and uh, landed some nice shots on Wuliji Burin in top position. And the dangerous aspect of his ground game, though, it's really his rear naked chokes in top position and his arm bars from bottom. He isn't a huge submission threat, but um, he will uh, threaten with those, and he has gotten them in the past. And his best trait is really his cardio, his heart. He will make you work, and uh, he is going to be there until the final bell, and he's dangerous. You know, we saw him get that third-round knockout in a fight he is probably down 2-0 in. But um, I like Andre Yule in this fight. I think that the boxing, I think there's a big difference. I see him being able to uh, land the straight left, rip to the body. I think Martinez is going to shell up when he's hit. And that's where Andre is going to throw uh, longer combinations. Uh, I don't think he's going to have to deal with a high-level wrestler here. I believe he can probably defend the takedowns of Martinez. And uh, Martinez isn't going to push a fast pace. Uh, I think he's going to be the lesser striker, the smaller guy also. You has definitely fought the higher-level competition. And uh, I see him beating Martinez here. I think it's going to be a firefight, but... Uh, I think he's going to TKO him, actually. So I'm going with uh, Andre Ewell to get the victory here. I'm next to your man. We have a really close fight. I really struggled picking this fight. It's uh, Domingo Pilarte taking on Journey Newsom. And uh, Domingo, he's making his second UFC start. He's looking for a better result. He was upset in his first fight. He was a big favorite. He lost a split decision to Felipe Colores. And uh, he's getting to fight in his hometown in Houston, Texas. And uh, he does train out of Texas as well. So, uh going to be in familiar territory going to be the hometown guy and uh he's going to be the much bigger guy as well he's six feet tall Newsom is only five foot five he's also going to have a six and a half reach advantage six and a six and a half inch reach advantage and um you know he was slow off the box in his UFC debut he didn't really move his back off the cage he allowed Cloris to clinch up with him against the feds and uh spent like four minutes in the first round controlled against the cage and you know, that has to be a wake-up call for Domingo. He can't start slow in the UFC where all these guys are really good. Hopefully, he's ready to go right away in this one. He is a southpaw. He does uh, use a long stance, a lot of kicks. He throws a lot of front leg side kicks, nice inside-outside low kicks, good oblique kicks to the knees. And uh, 
Nice front and round kicks to the body, to the head. I believe those kicks are going to be effective in this fight against a shorter guy. And um, he doesn't really throw his hands often, but he has some good one-twos. He'll throw a good jab left hooks. And he trusts in his chin. He'll sit down on hooks. Uh, he'll throw big uppercuts. And, uh, you know, when you throw that uppercut, it does leave you susceptible to being countered. We have seen him clipped and rocked uh, when he's throwing that uppercut. But uh, he's also rocked people with it as well. And he can fall in love with the punch sometimes or with the kick and uh, get very predictable. So his striking isn't the greatest for sure. But uh, he has good heart. He recovers quickly when he gets hurt. Uh, you definitely have to put him out to stop him. And uh, he has two KOs himself. He's never been finished. And... He's going to be looking to bring this fight to the mat, though, in my opinion. I mean, he's a strong grappler, and his build gives him a big advantage due to his length. I mean, if he can get on top of Newsom, who's only five foot five, I imagine it's going to be very hard for Newsom to stand up because Pilarte should also have an advantage in the clinch. And Newsom's fight with uh, Benito Lopez. Lopez was able to finish him with clinch elbows, and I've seen Pilarte throw similar elbows to the ones that finished him. In his match with Kolaris, though, Felipe really struggled with the physicality and the clinch. He couldn't get his back off the cage. He was taken down with body locks, but he did show good ability to get up from bottom. Uh, he has a pretty good guard. He'll throw up arm bars, triangles, uh, good Kimura sweep. And he will attack with front chokes as well to counter takedowns. Uh, and he has good double legs himself, good chain wrestling against the cage. He'll shoot doubles at range as well, but isn't as effective with them. And he will shoot shots at range too. Push opponents to the cage, work from there, wear on you. And he's good at getting the tight, tight way, circling to the back, get, getting the hooks in. And uh, once he takes your back, he's very hard to get up or get away from. Very good control there. Re pretty solid rear naked choke. Uh, he was able to choke out UFC veteran uh, Vince Morales on the Dana White Contender Series with that choke. And his match with uh, Felipe Claris, he did have Claris' back for almost the entirety of the third round, but wasn't able to get the submission in that one. He does have four submissions, and he's probably going to be looking to get one here versus Journey. He has good cardio, and he will be there for three rounds. I mean, he's definitely a fighter with, uh, you know, six finishes and eight fights. So he goes in there to finish fights, and he doesn't get tired. And when he goes on the scorecards, he tends to be a little shaky, though. He's only 2-2 two and two on the scorecards, and three of those fights have been split decisions. So very close fighter, or very close um, decisions usually when he fights. And um, Newsom, he's getting another stiff test, though, in his second appearance. This isn't an easy fighter. And uh, he had to fight Ricardo Ramos in his debut on short notice. And he didn't look terrible there, but he did lose a decision. So he's looking to get his first win in the Octagon also on February 8th. And he's an experienced guy. He's fought guys like Ricky Simone, Benito Lopez, Ricardo Ramos. I mean, he did lose to all three of those guys. But, um, you know... Um, it is experience. I mean, most of his victories, uh, if I'm being honest, have came, have came against lower level competition. But uh, he is light on his feet. He's explosive. He likes to bounce around on the outside. And uh, he exploded with hooks, overhands. Uh, really nice leaping left hook. Good overhand right. And uh, definitely has one shot power. I mean, I've seen him starch opponents with one punch. Uh, nice low kicks inside, outside. He will throw some lead leg side kicks as well. And he can throw some spinning kicks. Good head movement. He's definitely hard to hit. And his style of moving, countering, combined with the wrestling threat, kind of makes him tricky because of his height as well. And he can close the distance uh, kind of obviously at times, though. He doesn't feign his way in. And Hamas was able to land a really nasty spinning elbow that dropped him. But uh, he did recover quickly. And um, he has been finished only once by strikes against Benito Lopez. And he kind of quit in that fight. I mean, he got hit with shots and turtled up. So you never like to see that. But he should be the better striker here, in my opinion, in this fight. I just think he's a little bit quicker and um, a little bit more explosive. But Newsom, he's a short, compact, quick guy. And it makes him a good wrestler because he has good level changes. He times them very well. He will shoot some singles, doubles. He could struggle to finish takedowns, though. And, um, you know, he's good at getting using the entries to get opponents to the cage where he could chain wrestle, but he isn't really super dangerous in top position. Uh, he works up inside opponents' guards and works control, but his jiu-jitsu doesn't look super high level. He can get caught in arm bars, triangles, leg locks. He does do a good job of defending, but it can mute his offense. And, you know, he was able to survive when Ricardo Hamos took his back, and he did have uh, 
Hummels in a nice guillotine as well, and he was also able to stand up from bottom in that fight pretty quickly. He did prove he was a pretty good scrambler, and um, he has a bit submitted in his career. Um, he will look for front chokes. He does have one career Renika choke and uh, three submissions overall, and this is a tough fight for me to call. Like I said, I've been going back and forth. I think Newsom is definitely the faster fighter. I think he's going to have some success darting in, darting out. Um, you know, he, he has power also. I wouldn't be shocked if he put Pilarte down, but Pilarte is just so much bigger. He has an easy path to victory through throwing kicks, clinching up, looking to get this fight to the mat. And I think if he takes Journeys back like Hamos did, I don't think Hamos, or Journeys going to be able to get up. And if Domingo can mix up his kicks with a, a clinch game against the cage, get a couple takedowns, he should be able to win. Newsom isn't the guy that's going to be coming forward throwing heat. He isn't the guy that's going to be... Forcing Domingo on the back foot, most likely. And I think Domingo's going to be able to go forward. I don't think he's going to have to worry about uh, many takedown attempts or clutch control against the cage. Um, and my pick's going to be Pilarte via decision here. But I'm um, not, not very confident in this one. It could go either way, in my opinion. But I'm going to pick Domingo Pilarte. And up next, we have one of the more intriguing fights on the whole card, actually, with uh, Miles Johns taking on Mario Bautista. And um, Miles John, he's fighting out of Fortis. He's making his second UFC start. He did have a decision victory over Cole Smith. It was a hard-fought split decision. And, um, you know, he has a lot of hype behind him, though. He's looking to climb the ranks quickly. He was uh, a former LFA champion. He uh, is training out of Fortis, and he was undefeated at 10-0. and So he has a lot of things going for him, and he feels like he's ready to compete against anyone. But... On the feet, I don't really think John's is that good. He's athletic, he's powerful, which it does make him dangerous. And he does have a good step-in power jab. He'll throw some nice one-twos, the jab overhand right. He can explode in with some overhands and straight combinations. And he doesn't really have a lot of finesse, though. He doesn't really, uh, you know, faint level changes. He doesn't throw a lot of feints at all. He doesn't really disguise what he's doing very well. And he can be low volume outside of a few blitz attacks and in his last match he did show that he didn't really have good footwork at all going backwards he can get overwhelmed a little bit he does have good power and if you um you know blitz him he could catch you with something you have to respect that speed that power and close range and uh, if this fight's solely on the feet though i definitely think is gonna have a pretty sizable advantage but john's is undefeated and uh he has a lot of confidence to go along with two career knockouts but his grappling is really what gets him the victories. He did struggle a little bit with the grappling of Cole Smith, but that's his bread and butter. You know, he's a very good wrestler, um, big explosive double legs, very good at getting in on single legs, pushing opponents to the cage. He'll get high crotch slams. And on top, he was uh, able to overwhelm some low-level guys with ground and pound, but he isn't great on, uh, on top, in my opinion, either. He doesn't have the best top control, and he can kind of allow fighters to stand up from under him. And uh, when he's on top, he doesn't look to pass. He can kind of be stagnant. I've seen the ref stand him up before. And he struggles fighting off his back foot. Um, you know, when he gets back towards the fence. Uh, in his last fight, Cole Smith, he was able to clinch him up. He was getting some takedowns. And clinch, or Smith is a big guy, so, you know, that could have been partially the reason. But John's is a good scrambler. He usually can give his back to stand up. But he has had his back taken in multiple fights. And he will stay cool. And usually uh, will turn it into a, a good position. Or work his way back to his feet. And he isn't a big submission threat. He only has two in his career. But he has nice front chokes. And uh, he's never uh, been submitted in his career himself. But he can get tired in fights. Especially when he can't get takedowns. And this is a big step up for him in my opinion. It's a big test for him. And if he can win this matchup, I think it's going to prove that maybe he can compete with uh, some guys just outside of the top 15. But um, his opponent here, Mario Bautista, is another uh, young guy. He's training under the MMA lab. And he did suffer a loss in his UC debut, but that was against Corey Sanhagen, who's a top 5 contender. And he did bounce back with a win in this second UFC fight. And he was an underdog Going into that fight, he ended up winning a dominant decision, and he also won fight of the night as well. And, you know, maybe he doesn't have the same hype as Miles Johns, but a win for him here would change that all around. And But he stays light on his feet. He has good fakes, good feints. He uses, he uses a lot of movement. He never really stands in front of opponents. 
Uh, very nice long jab. Good one, too. He'll attack the body. Uh, good head movement. And he went to war in his last match. I mean, he was sitting in the pocket, blocking and returning, slipping and ripping, taking some shots to give some shots, and really battered Jin Su-sun. And he has very fast hands, although he can get wild and uh, lose his defense at times. He's extremely dangerous. And, uh, he has great kicks, nice low kicks, good body kicks, round kicks. And uh, he'll throw front kicks, uh, side kicks, body head. He could throw one, two head kick combinations. His head kicks are definitely dangerous. And I just feel like Bautista flows better, throws more combinations. He throws a massive amount of volume out there. And he's going to be a handful on the feet for a lot of guys to me. He does have two KO, TKOs, and seven wins. Uh, good defense. He's a fighter spirit as well. And you can tell he loves to fight. I mean... He'll get hit, he'll fire right back, and he's never been finished. He's also a former standout high school wrestler, good jiu-jitsu as well. And uh, he showed some good ability in his fight with Corey Sanhagen um, in the grappling realm, but he was ultimately caught in a submission. I definitely think that Bautista is the better jiu-jitsu fighter, better scrambler. In his fight with Jintu Sun, he showed some nasty clinch work as well. I mean, good uh, standing Kimura, really nasty elbows, good shoulder strikes, knees, great get-ups also, and he was never accepting bottom position. He has a nice double leg. He'll look for it at the end of rounds. And he was also able to pick up and slam Corey Sanhagen with the double. Uh, good front, uh, front choke series. And um, nice guillotines, Darces. I haven't really seen much footage of him in top position, but he does have a really good choke victory. And... Um, his one loss to Sanhagen in his career was uh, via armbar. But um, he has excellent cardio. He pushes a sick pace. And he needs to make Johns work. Keep him guessing. Keep him on the back foot. Maybe even shoot in on him. But I think Bautista should do this. Should win this fight handily. I mean, Johns is an athletic, explosive, powerful guy. So maybe he could touch Bautista and, uh, you know, hurt him or something. But I doubt it. I think Bautista is a much better striker. I think he's going to drown him with the volume. I feel like Bautista has shown great scrambling ability. And I don't think Jan John's going to be able to hold him down or do much with him um, if he does get him down. I think Bautista should just look to strike, uh, batter John's in the clinch when he works for takedowns. And I just feel like he's going to be much further ahead of John's. I think he might even go for some takedowns himself after he has John's thinking about the strikes a lot. And, um... I just think he's a little bit further ahead in his progression. And I think as the fight goes on and on, he's going to have better cardio as well. And uh, beat up Miles Johns as the fight goes further. So my pick's going to be uh, Mario Bautista via decision here in this fight. And now up next here we have Alex Morono. And he's taking on a short notice opponent here in Callan Williams. And uh, Morono, you know, he's getting the opportunity to fight in his hometown. And he... Is on the best run of his UFC career. I mean, he's moved to Fortis MMA. He's gone three and zero since, and he was originally scheduled to face Diego Lima here, but Lima's had to pull out, and uh, Williams is stepping in here. He's a UFC newcomer, and uh, Chaos Williams, Callan Williams, he, um, you know, he's nine and one. He is riding a five fight win streak, but hasn't really faced very good competition, and this is going to be a big step up for Williams and. Uh, Williams, he's a big athletic guy who comes to fight. He kind of seems a little bit like a wild man when he gets in there. He'll, you know, come forward, throw wild shots. Definitely has raw power. And I'm going to be pretty short on this breakdown, though, because when I checked out Chaos Williams, I wasn't really impressed with him. You know, he's a big athletic guy. He has some explosiveness. He has some dog. He will trade, and when he gets here, he wants to come back with big shots. And, you know, his defense is not good, though, and he's very hittable. He loads on all his punches. And he resorts, resorts to grappling in a lot of his fights. And the issue is his wrestling and jiu-jitsu are low level. I mean, I just don't think he's going to have anywhere to hide in this fight if it hits the mat. And I think Williams is going to be submitted or finished. Even if it, even if uh, he gets a top position at first, I think he'll get swept and finished. I think Williams is a puncher's chance. But um, Morono is the more technical striker. I think he should be able to counter, make Williams gun shy. And I think Murano's, if it gets to the ground, it's his fight to lose all day. And you'll probably finish it. So I'm going to say Morono will finish Williams some way over the three rounds. I just don't think Williams is uh, quite UFC level yet. So I'm going with uh, Alex Morono, who's a guy that I usually don't pick. But I think that in this fight, he should get it done here. So the pick's going to be Alex Morono. And uh, up next here we have a women's fight. Andrea Lee taking on Lauren Murphy. And Andrea Lee, you know, she's looking to bounce back. She did have her first UFC loss uh, 
when she fought Jojo Calderwood. It was a great fight. It was in Abu Dhabi, and she lost the decision there. But she's expected to get the win here. I mean, she's a big favorite. She is fighting close to home in Louisiana, and she also is from Texas, if I'm not mistaken. So she's going to be, uh, you know, having the crowd support, in my opinion. And she's going to be taking on Lauren Murphy, who, who also is trained out of Houston now. I mean, she's credited credited her move to Houston to being a huge part of her success. So I'm sure she's excited to fight here at Houston as well. And uh, she enters this spot with some momentum, some momentum. You know, she had a big result in her last match. She did knock out Mara Romero Barella. And uh, she's won two or three fights. And she's looking to take advantage of uh, opportunity here fighting a big name in Andrea Lee, who I, th I believe is in the top five or just outside the top five. But, you know, in my opinion, the UFC definitely wants Andrew Lee to get back on track here. I feel like this fight will look similar to the matchup with Ashley Evans Smith. You know, Lauren Murphy, she's tougher than Smith. I believe she's going to maybe try to pressure more, get inside, punch more than kick. And I think Lee has the range. She has the better kicks. She attacks body head with shots. She can move an angle. She throws nice jab, long punches. And I think that at range, it's going to be a big issue for Murphy with the speed as well. I really don't see Murphy having much success striking in this matchup. I just think she's too slow. And uh, she needs to work for takedowns, which is possible. But Lee's hard to take down and uh, just won't lay on bottom. I mean, she's good at getting up. She does have some issues with double leg takedown defense when they're timed well. But uh, she works back to her feet well. She doesn't get tired. And she's very strong herself. She can hold her own in the grappling. We've seen Lauren Murphy out-muscled by girls like Nico Montano. And, um, you know, she has nice level changes herself. I just feel like Lee, she's the younger fighter. She's the better fighter. Um, and barring a fluky loss or, you know, her really just having a horrendous performance, uh, don't see a lot of pass to victory for Lauren Murphy here. So... Going to be short and sweet with this one, and uh, picks going to be Andrea KGB Lee via decision. And I'm going to we have a fight with uh, Trevin Giles taking on Antonio Arroyo. Not really a huge fan of this fight, but, uh, you know, Trevin Giles, he enters his fifth UFC fight. He is 2-2 uh, two and two so far. He's on a two-fight losing streak, and he is, uh, you know, taking a little bit of a step down, I would say, after a step up of competition where he obviously wasn't ready for that. He got finished by a guillotine in both of those fights. And uh, the UFC sees a lot in Giles because even on a two-fight losing streak, they have signed him to a new four-fight deal. But he has to win here to prove his worth, get off to a good start in 2020. And he's going to be facing an 0-1 fighter in Antonio Arroyo. And uh, Arroyo, you know, he's looking for a better outing. Like I said, he dropped his UFC debut to a grappling specialist in Andre Muniz. And Arroyo is going to a better matchup here. You know, he's facing a striker who likes to grapple a little bit, but... Um, you know, it's not going to be 100% grappling, most likely. And this could be a fun fight. You know, it's two athletic guys. They're going to mix it up in there. And, you know, Giles, I was really high on him prior to his two losses. Uh, he showed a well-rounded game, and he was able to beat some guys like uh, Brendan Allen, Ryan Spann on the regional scene, who are now in the UFC getting wins. And he started his UFC career 2-0, and I, I thought he'd be uh, continuing to, uh, you know, win his next two fights. But, um... I got burned picking him, and he didn't really look good. You know, he's a guy that has flashy striking, and I think I kind of overrated it because he doesn't. He does have a very nice jab. He's light on his feet, good movement. He stays long. He works behind one twos. He'll go head body, good rear uppercut, left hook, uh, good straight right hand. And the issue I've seen with Giles though is in his last two matches is he doesn't like to exchange in the pocket, and he holds his hands very low. He relies on using his feet. Pot shotting, sliding in and out of range. Um, and if he doesn't have the speed advantage or if he gets cut off, he looks very uncomfortable trading. He can get caught and he doesn't go first a lot either. He can be low volume and he can be hard to hit. But if you pressure him and uh, back him up or get him in range, where, like I said, where you could exchange, he usually is ducking under for the clinch. He doesn't want to exchange with you. Even against a guy like Gerald Mearshart, who isn't a very dangerous striker, Giles, instead of just sticking and moving, he decided to go for a lot of takedowns. And I just think Giles knows he's hittable, doesn't have big faith in his chin. And he's predominantly someone who works with the hands. He likes to land the one-twos, get out the way, uh, um, throw some leg and body kicks. But when he loosens up, you know, he will throw some head kicks. And in his match with Zach Cummings, uh, 
you know, he did show some decent striking there, but he did get caught with the shot. He got dropped, and I don't think he really throws enough volume or hits hard enough to be landing short combos, um, you know, and winning a lot of fights. If he does, he's going to struggle in the UFC with his defense because, you know, if you're not landing longer combinations or stinging guys, they're going to be able to get inside eventually on you. And, you know, in this fight, I see him looking to get body lock takedowns and uh, work on top of Arroyo. You know, we saw Arroyo really struggle with the grappling of Andre Muniz, and he got very tired in that fight. Showed poor takedown defense. And, you know, Giles, he does have good body lock takedowns. He times them well. And, um, you know, he was able to get a takedown in every round of his fight with Mearshard. I just feel like uh, it will be harder to take down Arroyo, though, because it looked like Gerald was almost giving up the takedowns on purpose. And, um, you know, Giles, though, when he does get to dominant position or to top position, I will give him credit. You know, he's dominant there. Big hammer fist, big uh, ground and pound. And if he can posture up and, uh, you know, land some shots, his opponents are in big trouble. He likes to take the back where he has a couple of rear naked chokes. And he does have four submissions on his record. He has recently earned his brown belt as well. I'm sure that's what he's going to be looking to use here. But he has been caught in a guillotine in consecutive fights. And he does have five KOs. But I think Arroyo is the better striker. I think Giles is used to being the faster guy with better movement. And the fact that Arroyo can control range better and is faster, in my opinion, with both his hands and his feet, I think that's going to cause problems for Giles. For Arroyo, you know, he's big, he's explosive, great kicks, nasty leg kicks, body head. He'll throw big spinning kicks, jumping kicks. I would say he has one of the best, uh, or some of the best kicking technique in the entire UFC. And that kicking technique is going to be vital in this matchup. Um, if you can keep this fight at kicking range and keep the fight pretty, I see him having an advantage. Uh, he's an exploder when it comes to punching. You know, he dart in, he'll dart out. And he also holds his hands low. He can get hit in boxing range. They kind of are a little bit similar in terms of how they use their hands. But Arroyo has a big advantage with the kicks. Um, you know, Arroyo is athletic. I feel as time goes on, he's going to be harder to take down. But he really struggled with takedown defense. In his last match. And he did show some good heart. He was able to survive some deep submissions. Some bad positions. He worked his way back to his feet several times. But in this fight. You know he has to stay off of his back. And if he does get taken down. Work to get back up immediately. He isn't the greatest in top position. But um. You know I don't really think he's going to be looking for takedowns here. I don't really think. Uh, he's going to be looking to uh, do much on the ground. Um. You know, Royo, you know, if he can keep this fight on the feet, I think eventually he's going to find that kill shot that takes Giles out. And I don't think Giles, uh, I just don't have enough faith in him to pick him. So my pick's going to be uh, Antonio Royo via second round KOTKO. Um, this fight, we have Derek Lewis taking on Alir Latifi. And uh, Derek Lewis, you know, he's making a pretty quick turnaround like he usually does. He's fighting just three months after his victory over Ivanov. And he's fighting in his hometown of Houston, Texas. And he's. You know, always going to be hunting for that knockout, but I think especially in Houston, he's going to want to get it. And he came into that Ivanov fight in the best shape of his career, and he was noticeably fitter, and he kind of wants another opportunity at the UFC strap, so I think he's going to be, you know, looking in good shape again here. He's welcoming Alir to the division, and Alir, you know, um, I guess you could say looking for a new lease on life. You know, he's lost back-to-back -back fights, he's getting finished, and uh, he's decided to try to you know, move up to the heavyweight. He isn't getting an easy task in his debut, though, with Derek Lewis. He's fighting one of the biggest, hardest hitters in the division. And uh, he's only 5'8", so it's going to be interesting to see how he navigates fighting these bigger guys, even at 36 years old. You know, it seems like this could be a make-or-break fight for Latifi, but, you know, even Daniel Cormier, who, when we saw him in uh, Derek Lewis, he looks so much smaller. He's even 5'11", so, uh, you know, Alir's even shorter than that. But, Obviously, the game plan's simple for these guys, right? I mean, I think Alir, obviously, his striking is decent. He's going to be the fastest guy. He could explode in, explode out. And, um, you know, if he catches uh, anybody with one of those big overhand hammers, a straight punch, you know, he could put them on their butt. And uh, I think maybe he'll be attacking with body shots because everyone knows by now that Lewis is weak to the body. And body shots are a very good way to open up takedown attempts. But, um... You know, Latifi, I don't think he's going to want to strike with a guy like Lewis for very long. His chin isn't as good as it used to be. And uh, 
Lewis is going to be a guy that's very explosive, very big. He's going to have the reach advantage, a huge height advantage. He throws a lot of kicks, which could keep, um, you know, his opponent on the outside. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, full disclosure, I just had to go run and do something real quick. So kind of forgot where I was at in the breakdown here. So we're just going to kind of... Uh, I'm just gonna kind of tell it like what I think what I think is gonna happen, right? So, um, you know, th the way I really feel with this fight is, uh, you know, I just think that Alir he had gassing issues at 205, and um, if he thinks that he's gonna be able to just control a guy like Derek Lewis, take him down and control him, I think he's gonna have another thing coming because Derek Lewis, we've seen him get up on bottom against a lot of guys. I mean. No one has really been able to hold him down, take him down, control him on the mat. And uh, we see when Lewis gets up, he has full energy. He's exploding. He goes crazy. And he landed some huge shots on Ivanov. Even when you watched uh, Derek Lewis gets DC. In round one, he got up. Round two, you know, he did give up the back at the rear and he could choke. But um, I don't think Aaliyah is a guy that's going to be able to to lock in the hooks, get a rear and he could choke on Derek Lewis. I just really don't see that happening. I think that on the feet, um, you know, maybe Alir will be a little bit faster early, but I think he's going to gas out as uh, Lewis takes his shots, continues to walk walk him down. And um, I think that eventually, you know, I just think Lewis is going to catch him. I just think Derek Lewis is too big. I don't think Alir is going to take him down and hold him down. I think Alir is going to get progressively more and more tired as the fight goes on. And um, I just think Lewis is going to blitz. He's going to catch him and knock him out. So... I'm going to pick Derek Lewis be a second or third round KOTKO here. All right, so this fight we have Dan Ige taking on Mursad Bektik. It's actually a pretty fun fight. You know, both these guys are uh, fun guys to watch in most fights. And Bektik, you know, his career hasn't quite panned out as expected. You know, he was a highly tired prospect and he struggled to, you know, get over the hump so far in his UFC career. He was finished very quickly in his last match against Josh Emmett. And his chin's a little bit questionable at this point, but... He's still 28 years old. He has a lot of time to uh, turn it around, but I don't think he can afford to drop back-to-back -back fights here. And Dan Ige, you know, he's been on a hell of a run. You know, he's won four consecutive UFC fights, and uh, he's finally breaking into that upper echelon of division here. And, uh, you, you know, he's been rounding out his game. He's imp been improving with every fight, and he definitely is the fighter in better form currently with probably the stronger mindset and more confidence. And, um... You know, there's always been questions about Bektik's toughness, and there's never been uh, questions like that with a guy like Dan Ige. But Bektik, you know, he's an elite athlete. His striking offensively is very potent, sick grappling, and when he can, you know, be the hammer, he'll roll over you. He isn't a big kicker on the feet. He kind of likes to walk opponents down, boss the fight with his jab, his one-two, his hand speed. He's good in-and-out movement, and when he can land his combinations get out with getting counter. He's extremely hard to deal with because it opens up his wrestling. And once he has you ready for the one-two or the jab or the overhand right, that's when he ducks under in a perfectly timed singles, doubles. And his striking can be a little bit predictable. He can get a little bit wild when opponents pressure him. He can overextend. He can wing. And, um, you know, he also doesn't keep his hands up when he exchanges in the pocket. And he's shown a bad chin. He has been finished twice. He's been stunned on multiple occasions. I know Chaz Skelly would say he knocked him out also. But in this fight, he was dropped with the jab uh, versus, Be versus Emmett in his last fight. I'm sorry. And he does have power himself. He will mix up the target. He goes to the body. And um, he's very fast. I mean, while his striking may not be the greatest defensively, he still has the power to put you out. And, uh, you know, he's kind of... Uh, uncomfortable on the feet when opponents aren't scared of his speed and power though and really pushes the grappling and when back to take opponents down um especially in the center of the octagon he's very hard to stand up from under he'll move to side control the crucifix position he has big ground and pound and if opponents uh you know can get taken down near the fence though he doesn't really do as well with the control there opponents get stand up from under him and um you know, he can get a little bit tired if he can't get takedowns in space. But he does have a couple of Runica chokes. He isn't a big submission threat. He does have an insane takedown defense, though. I mean, he has 100% takedown defense. His cardio is questionable. And, you know, it's what led to his loss gets Darren Elkins. So, the luster has fallen off of Bektik a bit. And he just needs to remind everyone 
why so many people were hyped about him before he falls into obscurity here if he loses, but Dan Ige isn't going to feel bad for Bektik if he beats him, and Ige's a bad dude, I mean... For what Ige lacks its speed, power, explosiveness that Bektik has, he has that mentality and that heart that Bektik just doesn't have. And Dan Ige is a strong wrestler. He's a black belt. And in this match, I feel he should look to keep it on the feet, though. I feel as if Ige tries to grapple, he's just going to get stonewalled, outscrambled. And Ige has improved his striking a lot. He isn't the fastest fighter. And, uh, you know, instead of chasing opponents, trying to walk him down, He'll stay back, he'll counter more, and he throws tight punches on the inside. He'll throw overhand right or some straight punches, but he doesn't throw much at range anymore. And uh, He did land a nasty left hook that sat Kevin Aguilar down in the pocket. And in this fight, he needs to use smart pressure, cut the cage off, make it a close range fight. And he isn't much of a kicker, but he does have some nice low calf kicks. Um, you know, he needs to catch Beck because he's coming in with a knockout shot. Or walk him down, force him to trade and take him out. And Ige was able to uh, have long periods of top control in all of his fights so far in the UFCs that he's won. And I just don't think he's going to have that against Bektik. He needs to be ready to weather a storm, uh, you know, most likely. And then beat Bektik as the fight goes on. I think Ige is definitely live to catch Bektik here. But I actually like Bektik here. I think he's too fast. I think on the feet he's going to be able to beat in, beat out. Attack body heavy combinations. And uh, I don't think he's going to get hit a ton. I also think Bektik will be able to get takedowns, control against the fence. And I just see him as the bigger, better athlete, better wrestler, better scrambler. So my pick is going to be uh, Bektik here via decision. <laughs> and I'm next here. I, I really don't know why this fight is the fucking fight before the two title fights. But Justin Taffa taking on Wad Adams in a uh, pretty low-level heavyweight fight. And... Uh, Juan Adams, you know, he's his back against the wall here. He's lost consecutive fights. and In his last fight, after calling out Greg Hardy for so long, he was finishing in embarrassing fashion. And due to that, you know, he's made some wholesale changes. He's moved his camp to Jackson Wink. He's changed his diet. And he's looking to finally start living like a professional athlete. Try to, uh, you know, get the maximum out of his uh, capabilities. And he is fighting in his hometown of Houston, Texas. He should have a lot of motivation coming in here. And uh, for Justin Taffa, you know, he had a rude, rude awakening in his UFC debut. Uh, he was knocked out brutally by Jorgen Castro, and he only has a record of 3-1. and one. So a loss here, I think, would almost certainly lead to him, be, lead to him being cut. I don't think they would keep around a guy that's 3-2. And, two. and uh, Taffa, he's been training out of Tiger Muay Thai for this camp, getting good training. But um, Justin Taffa, you know, he really hasn't shown much in his career. He's really just shown power and the ability to brawl. He is a southpaw. He does have power in his left hand. I mean, he'll, he'll rip the body. He'll throw some uppercuts, some hooks. But he's slow. Really needs to back opponents towards the cage to get them to brawl with him to be successful. And uh, when he can get in a pocket fight, he's showing some durability, some counters. And he could put opponents out. He's a big guy. I mean, in his UFC debut and MMA debut, we saw the issue with the style. I mean, he's slow. So if his opponents move, he'll overextend, leave easy counter opportunities. Even in the pocket where I feel he's at his best, he's just sloppy brawling. It's not technical. He got knocked out cold overextending in his uh, UFC debut. And in his MMA debut, he had to rely on grappling to win the fight. And in the grappling realm, I mean, he showed a very sloppy single leg. But I would be shocked to see him take down Adams with that. Tafa, you know, he showed very little ground skill. He was swept. He was reversed by a low-level guy. He just looks like a sloppy brawler to me who looks like... He wants to find the home run, and I haven't seen an opponent shoot a takedown on him, but I would say he probably doesn't have the greatest takedown defense. Against the cage, he will leave his feet very close together. I've seen opponents with, uh, you know, good shot at range, uh, you know, um, probably being able to duck under and take him down as well, and he scores up a lot. I think if Adams takes Toffa down, I think Toffa's going to be in trouble. You know, Adams, he's a former college wrestler. And he should look to use those skills in this matchup. I mean, I think he's the more technical striker. He has the better jab. But he's very much developing on the feet. And uh, he's going to be longer. I mean, you should just stick to using jabs, low kicks. And, um, you know, he has power in his shots as well. But the issue with him is he leaves his chin high. He's very hittable. And in this matchup, you know, take the path of least resistance. Get the fight to the ground. I think if he gets a top position, I see him taking tough out. I really feel in this fight that Adam just has to avoid being clipped. 
uh, with the big shot early or even whenever. I mean, being clipped by a big shot at any point in the fight. And I think if he gets in on the legs or gets in on a body lock, Tafa's going down and it's smash time. I mean, I think the fact that Adams is moving to Jackson Wink, I think they'll have a good game plan for him. I think he's going to be in the best shape he's ever been in. And it's winner, uh, you know, winner or loser leaves town. You know, it's a loser leaves town match. So uh, it's in Houston where Adams is from. And I think that Tafa's coming all the way from Australia. It, it would be a bad loss for Adams to lose here. So I'm going to go with Adams getting the takedown, getting the late first round TKO here. All right, we're moving into the co-main event here and one of the two title fights on the card with uh, Valentina Shevchenko taking on blonde fighter Caitlin Chukagian. And uh, Valentina, you know, she's looking to continue her soul on the flyweight division. Um, third title defense here for her, and she's yet to lose a round at flyweight. Looks very much unbeatable. And she's a minus 1,200 favorite in this fight. It just shows how head and shoulders above the competition she is. And uh, Chukagian, I mean, she's going to be looking to flip the script. I mean, as... Um, you know, as of now, everyone sees her as the pig being led to slaughter. Uh, she's a plus 700 underdog. No one's given her much of a chance. But, you know, she's in a much bigger spot than she's ever been in her career. Chukagian, she's had eight UFC fights. None have even been on the main card, much less the co-main event. I mean, her style, you know, has had the UFC weird of showcasing her. And uh, she's even been, like, the first fight of the night on some fights. Like, Joanne Calderwood versus Chukagian, which was... Uh, Considered a number one contender's fight was the first fight of the night on a card, and um, but if she can win this fight, she's gonna be undeniable. Um, if she could dethrone the Queen Valentina, and you know when I was looking at this fight, man, I was trying to find a lot. I was trying to find ways that I could say, okay, this is how Caitlyn is gonna beat Valentina, right? Because everyone's gonna come in here and pick Valentina. They're gonna have the preconceived notion that Valentina's gonna make easy work of Caitlyn. You know, I actually think Caitlyn, you know, uh, to give her some credit, I think she's a good fighter. You know, I think that uh, she's one of the best female fighters uh, in all divisions. I mean, she's very well-rounded, very good boxing. I mean, her hands are getting better and better. She's sitting down on her punches more, her straight punches. She's throwing more hooks, more overhand. She's varying it up a little bit more. And um, her kicks are always going to be there. I mean, those front leg attacks are really nice. She... um you know, um, throws those kicks like jabs. And she also has a very good ground game. I mean, she's working with John Donaher. Very good guard. So, I mean, she's a well-rounded girl. And she's athletic. She can move. Uh, she knows how to fight with angles. She's good. I mean, she's very good. But she's not someone that commits a lot. And she struggled. You've seen in fights with Jessica I, With fights, uh, girls like Liz Carmucci. When she gets pressured, she can uh, get, a lot, get a little... I mean, she's good at... Uh, when she has much better footwork, much better feet, much faster than girls, she'll angle, she'll make them look silly. But uh, the main things that she struggled with are overhands over the top, on the feet, and leg kicks. And she struggled with the low kicks a lot. And I just feel like she doesn't hit hard enough to, you know, back Valentina up. I mean, she does have some dangerous attacks when she threw the one to uh, to high kick. or Those high kicks are dangerous. But Valentina, I believe that Valentina is actually fought a better version the better version of Caitlyn in Holly Holm and Holly's the bigger girl I think she's a better athlete I think Holly throws more impactful kicks but both of them throw kicks I think maybe Chukagian is a little bit quicker better footwork and uh, Valentina's gonna have to you know go in there she's gonna have to figure out the style but I think eventually you know she's gonna be countering she's gonna be hitting with one shot attacks that make Caitlyn a little bit hesitant and I see Caitlyn Starting to, you know, make noises, throw from the outside, not want to commit, missing by a mile. And I think that if Valentina gets takedowns, she can get takedowns easily as well. Because I think that in the clinch, um, you know, Caitlin just lacks the physicality. I think Valentina's going to be much stronger in the clinch. I think she can batter her with punches and elbows in the clinch as well, knees. And um, I think as long as she just takes her down and avoids the guard or passes guard quickly, she's going to have success holding down Caitlin as well. We saw that with Liz Carmouche, and uh, man, I mean, I just don't see a lot of paths to victory for Caitlyn. I will say that uh, I think Caitlyn's going to give her a different look than these other girls have given her. I think that she's going to go in there with confidence. I think that she's going to be thinking she's going to win, even in the cage. But uh, I just don't think that she's dangerous enough to pose threats to Valentina. They're going to make her back up, and I think Valentina's going to be able to find a rhythm, start countering. I think that 
if it becomes a problem with her on the feet or it's close, I think Valentina can time those body lock takedowns, get the clinch control there. I think she's going to be the stronger, physically stronger girl. And uh, I actually kind of feel like uh, Kaylin's going to survive, though. I mean, I feel like Kaylin will make it all five rounds, but uh, I think Valentino will win a dominant decision here. And, um, you know, regain her title and uh, once again, um, you know, show why she's uh, pound for pound and she's one of the best female fighters of all time. So, the pick's going to be Valentina Shevchenko via decision. And, all right, we made it, baby. The main event, John Jones, Dominic Reyes. And, um, you know, uh, first off, I want to see some guys are, I see some guys are taking Dom Reyes. I mean, uh, shout to Layton, you know, UFC gambling addicts. I saw he took Dom Reyes on his video, but, uh. Yeah, so let's get into it. You know, John Jones, Dominic Reyes, right? Uh, there's, uh, you know, question marks that John Jones potentially, you know, um, struggles against tall guys. Uh, you know, Reyes is obviously a tall guy. There's question marks that, you know, John Jones is, you know, struggled against southpaws a little bit. You know, against Leota Machida, Dominic Reyes is a southpaw. There's questions that Dominic Reyes, or I mean that John Jones is, struggled with athletes or hasn't faced many athletes according to Dominic Reyes and uh you know Dominic Reyes is probably the best athlete he's ever ever fought I would say and um man but having said all that when I was watching the tape I mean Dominic Reyes he's a guy that to me he's very one-dimensional man I mean he'll throw he doesn't throw many kicks uh I don't think his kicks are going to be very dangerous He's very good at controlling distance, and he has good, uh, you know, awareness with angles. Uh, he could definitely, you know, catch, or I mean, move on an angle, catch you, drop you. His takedown defense is very good. His takedowns, I mean, aren't that good. I mean, I would be shocked if he tried to take down Jones, much less took him down. And, uh, you know, he does uh, rely a lot on countering, you know, or relies a lot on, uh, you know, forcing or making you go first, I do think that he's going to allow Joe to control the center of the cage. And, uh, you know, he's going to be looking for that home run with the left hand, you know, the straight left, the straight, or the left uppercut. And um, he will throw th some right hooks, but really, man, I mean, it's predominantly all with that left hand. I mean, all the, like John Jones said, <laughs> left straight, left straight. But, man, I mean, he does have a left uppercut. Uh, I'm not saying he's, he's not good. He's very good. I mean, we saw that precision shot against Chris Weidman and, if he lands one of those uh, straight pistons on John Jones, uh, maybe he'll put John Jones out. But, you know, John Jones, I believe on the feet, is even going to have a big advantage because I think he's going to be the one that's going to control the control the distance because I think that Reyes just traditionally, um, in a lot of his fights, now that he's been fighting higher-level guys, he'll give up the center kind of to uh, play that sniping game, that finesse game. And Jones, I don't think he ever really has to get in a boxing range with him. He could just throw kicks, kick to the body, kick to the leg, kick to the body, and then clinch up with him. And I think that if he clinches up and takes him down, I think that on top he's going to have a huge advantage over Reyes. I think that in the clinch he's going to have an advantage over Reyes. And, um, you know, Reyes, uh, he did have a five-round fight scheduled in his last fight, but he's never been five rounds. We did see him get tired when he fought Vulcan with the forward pressure. And when, when he gets forward pressured, I mean, he is good going backwards. Don't get me wrong. I mean, obviously, he's good with the pull counters with the left hand. But if you can avoid that, if you could see that coming, you could attack the low kicks. You could keep him moving backwards. So he can get a little bit wild and get a little bit hittable. And I feel like Jones, you know, has a chip on his shoulder in this fight. You know, his last fight, people were saying they thought he lost, that he's slowing down, all this stuff. And the last time, you know, he had a chip on his shoulder... He destroyed Alex Gustafson, finished him in the third round, barely got hit. And, um, you know, we saw when he fought, fights DC, he has that chip on the shoulder. And uh, I think that Dominic Reyes, you know, he's been talking, he's been saying a lot of things that have fired Jones up. And I think Jones is going to come in tuned up for this fight and wanted to make a statement. And, uh, you know, I just, I think that he's going to be able to, like I said, I think that Reyes is too one-dimensional. He only wants to use the hand, so I think that, Jones is going to be able to use the kicks on the feet to make it a big difference, man. I think he's going to use body kicks, low kicks, and eventually start going to the head. Um, and I think that when Reyes blitzes in, he's going to try to clinch up. Maybe go for some takedowns. He hasn't been wrestling as much lately, but I think that in this fight, maybe he wants to humble Reyes. So uh, if he gets top position, man, he has some of the best ground pound in the sport. And um, 
Man, I just don't think a guy Reyes. What are, the only only way he has to win is knockout. He's not going to win a decision. He's not going to submit John Jones. And we've never even seen John Jones dropped. Man, we've he has a sick chin. I mean, he's been fighting guys that are knockouters. Tiago Santos has the most knockouts in the history of the light heavyweight division. He might have the most knockouts, so uh, high close to the most knockouts in UFC history. And you know, Reyes, man, I just. I can't do it. I mean, I can't do it. I can't pick Reyes to be the guy to beat John Jones. I think that John Jones is too smart. I think that he's going to be able to read this guy pretty quickly. And, um, you know, I just think Reyes, you know, I'm listening to his interviews as well. And I think John Jones is in his head a little bit, man, because he's talking a lot about what John Jones is saying, what John Jones wants him to think. And, you know, he's not falling into that. But I think he's in his head, man. I think that he's a little bit, you know, I don't know. I don't want to say that he's over, over his head because obviously jo- Dominic Reyes could win this fight and make me look like an idiot. And if he does, you know, all props to him. But um, I'm not seeing it, man. And uh, I think John Jones, third round TKO with uh, ground and pound in this one. And so for uh, the parlay of the week that I'm going to give for this week, it's going to be um, Andre Yule and Andrea Lee as the parlay of the week. And for my underdog pick of the week, it's going to be uh, Yusuf Zalal. I also like uh, Miles, or I mean Mario Batista a lot as an underdog as well. Other underdog I picked for you guys is um, Antonio Royo, I believe, is an underdog. And um, other than that, you know, I think most of the favorites should hold serve, get the victory there. But yeah, guys, thanks for fo- thanks for listening to this UC two forty seven breakdown. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you guys got some good information out of it. And uh, like I said, make sure to comment, like, subscribe. Let's try to get to a. Uh, 200 likes on this one and uh we're on the road to 3,000 subscribers you know we're almost uh not almost there but uh you know we're working there and uh we're gonna get there before the end of the year so uh we're gonna hit this parlay again and um you know let's have fun watch these fights